Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. It's great to be back. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio on September 2nd, 2015. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, normally broadcasting Wednesdays from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. Been on a little bit of a hiatus. I uh, was at the Mount Shasta Conference uh, last week and also in Bermuda with my parents a little before then, and I was unable to do any shows uh, the week before that because Ed Baker, who was uh, running for president as a third-party candidate, had to uh, postpone his uh, show with me on the Wednesday before I went on vacation. And uh, uh, John and Bonnie Mitchell um, unexpectedly, well, they told me they could do a pre-recording session with me um, on August 27th, but then they sent me an email saying we will not be able to do any interviews with anybody in the near future. Sorry for any con- inconvenience. Um, I can't help but wonder what that was all about. I hate to think that entities are harassing them or something to keep them from giving out important information because they really seemed interested in uh, making sure that they would be available for that pre-recording session. But I will be contacting Ed Baker and John and Bonnie Mitchell in the very near future, like maybe within the next uh, two weeks for Ed Baker and the next two months for John and Bonnie. Hopefully they will come on. But today on the show, we will have Wendy Kennedy, who's a Pleiadian ET channeler. She has a passion for enlightenment. She's been channeling for 20 years now, working with different beings from different star systems and dimensions, uh, most prominently the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective, which are nicknamed the Peas. Excuse me. In the early 90s, she began having visions and eventually came across channeling. After much research and practice, she became an outstanding channeler from both a written and a verbal perspective. One of her main goals in life is to inform inform people that everyone has the ability to channel. Her website is www.higherfrequencies.net. Uh, I have three people here in the queue, area code 770, area code 229, and also the number 111111111111. I'm not sure which one of those is um, Wendy. I'm hoping one of them is Wendy, but after I finish the news here, I will check all of you guys and see which one is the proper number. If any of you are calling in to talk to Wendy, uh, just so you know, I will not be taking calls until um, 7.15 p.m. Eastern which is about an hour and 13 minutes away. But please do not hang up. I assure you I will be taking your call. Just be patient and all that. So um, first, as usual, we are going to do the news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. First article, breaking. Massachusetts police cruiser bursts into flames after coming under gunfire. This is the first article here. Gunman escapes scene after... Unloading on cop car. Oh, my God. Another police shooting. Another. Well, this time someone's shooting the police. I mean, look, a lot of cops are corrupt. A lot of cops are being taught that the uh, common person is the enemy and that a lot of peace, police don't seem to understand that their one and only job is to keep the peace. And that's it. And and they're abusing their authority and all. But that is no excuse for the kind people to be shooting and killing the police. I mean, what I mean, you do have the right if you're. If you're um, uh, being arrested by an officer and the officer uses more force than is necessary to facilitate the arrest, yes, you do have the right to kill the officer in self-defense. There's plenty of case law to back that up. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, not just because killing someone is is wrong, obviously, but um, even if you do manage to um, kill the officer in defense and get the incident on film and and show the case law that backs up your right to do that, you would still be in far greater danger than you would be simply submitting to the arrest, as it seems like the courts um, seemingly at will without nowadays are basically um, siding with the police in all such situations and will find you guilty no matter what. And, um, well, I'm not sure if this is retaliation or, I mean, it's probably not a um, false flag or anything like that to justify taking away people's rights because people are attacking the police, but, but still... No, no excuse for the common people to just be uh, to be attacking the police because they seek revenge on the police. There's better ways of peaceful, nonviolent protests like Gandhi preached. So let's try to um, refuse to cooperate with the police. Um, I mean, invoke your rights if they arrest you. Just get the incident on film and then sue the police later. All right, next article. Democrats hire illegal alien to recruit new voters. Uh, quote, no wonder this nation has a border and an illegal alien crisis, unquote, Judicial Watch said in response. Well, don't have time to look into who the Democrats were who hired this illegal alien to recruit no voters, but we all know that um, they are bringing illegals into this country, illegal immigrants, uh, without any sort of a process to uh, take our jobs and screw over the economy and, and all that. 
I mean, you know what my take on illegal immigration is. I would love to see the day where we could all cross international borders without government permission and paperwork filing and, and dock our ports into international ports without having to uh, go through like an Ellis Island type procedure to – to immigrate, but but you have to understand, folks. In this matrix, not all borders are created equal. I mean, just look at America. The Mexican border and the Canadian border are different in so many ways, and uh, it really doesn't hurt to have immigrants go through some sort of a process just to come to this country. So um, until that day comes, we can cross borders uh, in a peaceful manner and have all borders created equal. Let's understand that having illegal aliens come and, and do things like this, whether be it a conspiracy or not, is not a good idea. Our next article, fast food worker refuses to serve cop. Example of growing animosity toward law enforcement. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, come on. This, this, this is kind of ridiculous. Y yes, people are getting really, really pissed off at the police and all that, but – I, I mean, I mean, know a fast food chain has the right to refuse to serve to any particular person as they are a private company and that they can do that. But but still, it was not in their best interest to do this, I believe, not to mention he lost out on some good money just because he refused to serve to this cop. So um, I don't think I need to go over that any further. Next article, Black Lives Matter leader says, quote, pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon, uh, unquote, chant was intended as playful. Uh, claims police want you to join in the march. Everybody loves bacon. All right, uh, this sounds like another uh, incident of hating the police. I don't think I need to go into any any of this further. Black Lives Matter sure mean, seems to be getting in the news a lot for, for this kind of thing. And, oh, my God, all sorts of uh, articles here. I'm looking down quickly, skimming over the bottoms here. Infowars is really going nuts with all these things about people hating the police. Uh but anyway, our next article, Illinois cops lock down town in search for suspects in police shooting. Militarized cops tell residents to stay inside their homes. Well, we all know what happened after the Boston bombing. And by the way, if anybody wants to learn about the Boston bombing, check out my interview with InfoWars reporter Dan Badondi. He exposed that. He became well known for asking questions at the press conference like, is this Boston bombing a part of a conspiracy to have uh, police and Homeland Security go all over the nation and stick their hands on people's pants and violate people's rights to, to promote Homeland Security? And the uh, mayor, of, uh, excuse me, the governor of Massachusetts was like, uh, no, next question. <laughs> and, and then the next thing you knew, militarized police were banging on the doors of Boston and without warrants and barging into people's homes and forcing them out just to search for people. I mean, locking down a town and search for suspects, you have to understand if – please, you need to understand if you want to lock down a town to search for people, it'd be my guest. But if you knock on someone's door and they ask for a warrant and you don't have a warrant, then they have every right to refuse to let them in. If you break down their, their door to search, then it's probably illegal for those people to – to charge you with burglary because you are committing burglary. And if you arrest the people after burglarizing them and take them away, that's kidnapping. So, uh, so please don't abuse your authority. It's not too much to ask. Uh, next article, kill whites and cops, black lives matter affiliated radio shows calls for race war, race war. Here we go again. Quote, it's all about to go down. It's open season on killing white people and crackers. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, here we go with Black Lives Matter again. I don't think I need to talk about this anymore, although I haven't really gotten into the race war stuff. Let's try not to start a divide and conquer thing. Anytime the powers of B see a moment in the news where they can um, start a race war, be it like Trayvon Martin or, or any of that other stuff, don't fall for it. Let's try to get along no matter what the color of our skin is. We're all humans. We're all a mixture of many different ET groups. <laughs> yeah, humans are a hodgepodge of um, many different types of ET genetics. I'm sure I'll be talking about that with when, Wendy when I have her on my show in a few minutes, but um, in a couple minutes. But uh, let's not kill whites and cops. Um, right, I've been talking about this for so much. Let me just point out, best way to um, invoke your rights when dealing with police encounters, the um, video, Secrets Police Don't Want You to Know. Again, the video is called Secrets Police Don't Want You to Know. It's on the Alex Jones channel. Um, Eddie Craig, who was a guest on my show, talks about how to invoke your rights with police encounters. He says, get it all on film, too, so you can sue the police if they arrest you and, and all the rest of it. So um, everybody's got to watch that and check that video out. I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, one last article here. Alternative media invades mainstream media territory. Infowars expanding its reach. Okay, that's good. Um, the mainstream media, if you're – well, we shouldn't invade the mainstream media in a in a uh, terrible way, but uh, let's try to um, maybe encourage the mainstream media to expose the truth. It's better to go after the mainstream media than the government because if media is forced to report the truth, then the government will eventually have no choice but to, but to expose the truth. But – 
That is enough of that. My God, I got a lot of listeners here in the queue and a lot of guests here. My God, this is a uh, very, very popular guest indeed. Oh, I had a lot of um, a lot of people speaking to me before this show uh, about how popular Wendy Kennedy is. But like I said, I'm going to have to uh, call a bunch, check to see who exactly Wendy is here. So um, let's start off with um, this one 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 number. Um, area code one 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 one. Is that Wendy? You got me on the first try. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how about that? Awesome, awesome. Okay, it's uh, great to have you on. I don't know if any of these callers want to talk to you, but I did say I will not be taking calls for another hour and five minutes. So uh, I guess you might as well get rocking and rolling right off the bat. Um, I must actually uh, plea ignorance uh, about you. I haven't really heard much about you. I've only um, heard, I guess, of you when I was um, recommended, when you were recommended by someone who listens to my show. And, um, well, a couple of people say you're the greatest Pleiadian channel or ever. Well, um, something tells me Billy Meyer might have a fit with that one. But um, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, uh, we'll probably have him in conversation a few times in this interview anyway. But before we talk about that, you have been channeling for 20 years now. It says working with a variety of different beings from different star systems and dimensions. Um, I, I suppose I'll give you the chance here quickly. Run down the list of all the different beings from different star systems and dimensions. List them all. And maybe if I hear, I'll try running them down as you go along, and then maybe throughout the interview we can go over them in greater detail. Oh my gosh, that's so many. Um, I first started with my own angelic guides, so I, I do work with the angelic realms, um, but they tend to step back just a bit. And the Pleiadian Collective that I work with, they're a group of beings from the ninth dimension, and they're beings of light, so they don't have physical form. And then I also work with. Um, Beings are in the 12th dimension, and uh, two of them are part of a group that they describe themselves as original planners. They're kind of master geneticists and help to create and structure um, universal blueprints. So I do work um, very closely with two of them. And then also uh, beings from Lyra have shown up for me, beings from Arcturus, Sirius, Orion, most, well, um, some of those are beings of light. Again, they don't have physical form, and then some do have physical form. Um, some of the Syrians, um, felines, uh, they've shown up for me part of the Sirius High Command, and uh, they tend to give me meditations and tools to help people um, physically move through the transition. So, you know, it's just it's a wide variety um, I don't so much work with people who have passed away. That's not really the realm that I connect with, although occasionally I'll get bits and pieces of information um, from people who passed away. But generally it's it's more the celestial realms. So Thank you very much. Kind of a quick overview. All right, so that, that's cool. By the way, I'm going to be on mute whenever I um, speak to you, so if it takes a couple of seconds for me to get off, that's the uh, that's the reason why. Uh, it, it says here you've um, d- done automatic writing, and writing seems to be uh, very key to your work. I mean, don't get me wrong, that that's uh, certainly a good thing to do um, because, well, in my interview with Maury Zelkovich, she talked about how when you uh, write things down, it, it actually seems to manifest better than than it would if you don't write them down. I'm going to assume that that has something to do with why you do automatic writing. Well, well, first of all, automatic. Why the word automatic? What's that all about? Well, because it's it's almost as if you're writing, but you're not you're not doing it. Your hand is moving automatically. And when I first started channeling, I was trying to do it verbally, and the words just wouldn't come out. But I would have very visceral. Um, sensations, my eyes would flutter in water and my hands would tingle. And so I played around with it for quite a while, um, for probably about nine months before I knew one day I was just supposed to sit down with pen and paper and and all of a sudden the pen actually started to move. Um, So if I were to do the automatic writing, I could write 20 pages and my hand wouldn't cramp or be tired because there's all this extra energy running through it. But if I were to do that just by myself, I'd get through two pages and I'd start to feel it in my hand. So I did the automatic writing for, again, about nine months um, before I was hearing the words well in advance of the writing that was coming out. 
and then I just put the pen down and started channeling verbally. So I will still do the automatic writing for myself because it's easier for me to retain the information because when I channel, it's a bit like a lucid dream. So the information is fresh for um, probably about 10, 15 minutes, and then it starts to fade. So if if I want to really remember something, if it's for me, then I will do the automatic writing. Awesome. Um, you, let's talk about these 12th dimension master geneticists for a moment. Uh, 12th dimension, uh, before we talk about the master geneticists, he, he's like, just to clear up some confusion here, it seems like um, whenever you talk about dimensions or how many dimensions there are, uh, George Kavaslis uh, once told me it's really a um, matter of a person's perspective because people might give different numbers of dimensions as to how yeah. many they, they know because their um, vision, their layout of the universe is different from other people, although it seems like 12 dimension and 22 dimension are like two of the more common uh, numbers. And when I interviewed George in a private session, he told me that in his 12-dimensional layout that he sees, he could imagine that there is a layer that he can see where one might interpret that as being 10 layers in one, which might cause someone to see a 22-dimensional universe. So I guess that explains why uh, 22 dimensions and 12 dimensions are the two most prominent. But I'm guessing that you are of the 12 dimension faction because you talk about how the, well, I could be wrong, but it seems like the, uh, if you're talking about master geneticist ETs, they're like, like for all intents and purposes, the cream of the crop right below the creator of sorts. Um, so, well, why don't you give your take on how many dimensions there are and what you think of when you, when you think of numbers of dimensions. And then we'll, after that, we'll talk about these master geneticists specifically. Well, the guides do describe it to me the same way as you were just talking about it. They use 12, um, but they said, you know, you might hear other numbers. 144 is another one that you'll hear quite a bit. They said it really is just the the system that you're using to define a dimension, whether it, it would be like using inches or centimeters. Um, the length is still the length. It's just the unit of measure that you're using to describe it. So um, they use 12 when they talk to me. Okay, and these master geneticists, uh, what is it about them that makes them, like when you talk about a geneticist, uh, I often think of the Anunnaki because George Kavaslis, he told me that uh, like the term Anunnaki, it doesn't just refer to the Anunnaki from Nibiru that Zechariah Sitchin talks about. That's just one faction of Anunnaki. The, the whole entire hodgepodge of different Anunnaki races can best be described as the children of a universal geneticist entity known as Anu and the Anu that was the king of Nibiru um, that Sitchin would talk about was like a um, as above so below lower form of the universal geneticist um, entity Anu if that makes sense but um, is is there any correlation here or are you talking about a different um, species of uh, master geneticist when you talk about these 12th dimension master geneticists? Mm, this is a different level. This is not not so much um, beings who have physical form. So they're again they're beings of light, and it's it's when you get up to the 12th dimension, it's not really like this individuated consciousness in the way that we experience it here. So every being is almost a collective in and of itself. So if one being refers to themselves in, in the singular, it's actually a collective of beings. And they work with kind of laying out the general blueprint uh, for for the galaxy and actually for the universal structure. So let's organize a sector of the universe over here that has um, this particular set up. They have these particular challenges and let's create a species that has um, this particular trait and we can borrow from the genetic material over here and we can take from here. So they kind of help to organize that and part of the way that they do that, it's not so much physical manipulation, but it's holding thought resonance to pull it into being. So they don't they're not there kind of splicing together DNA, but rather they're working with the light programs that will create the physical bodies if it is a physical planet or if it is a, a physical species, they might be beings of light. So 
they work kind of on the higher level of the blueprint, um, a little higher than, say, the Anunnaki or how we perceive the Anunnaki to be. All right, and is mainstream science wrong in regards to the whole Big Bang theory? Can we assume that the Big Bang is, uh, as the British would say, a load of bullocks? <laughs> that might be a better question for the peas. Um a lot of it is not as we perceive it to be, and that's what I'm hearing them say now. Um, so some of what science understands is correct, but it's taken out of context, so it's misinterpreted. Right, and Alex Collier in his um, talks in the mid-90s uh, was talking about a race of um, ETs known as the Founders who um, see, who basically were playing a role in creating the universe of many galaxies. Could Is it possible that the founders he was talking about and these 12th dimension master geneticists are one and the same? It sounds very similar. Yes, it feels very similar when you, when you use that term. As I feel into the energies, it feels very similar. Hmm. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Uh, let's move on to these different races here. Uh, before we get to the P's, I want to um, talk about some of these other groups. Uh, Lyra, when we think of Lyra, we think of where the human race was um, originally came from. And I remember doing a show back in the day um, where I did, uh, based on an article called Characteristics of ET Races, I did the show by myself. And when they talked about the different races from Lyra, there was like a whole slew of different extraterrestrial races that like Lyra had more than any other. And if you believe that humans are a hodgepodge of of different ET races in terms of their genes, then it only makes sense that Lyra would be home to, 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 to so many different races. But these specific um, uh, races uh, from Lyra that you talk about, oh, one more thing. Uh, it's been said by those in the ET contact community that um, eons ago there was the Orion Wars, and I believe that um, the malevolent faction from Orion and the benevolent faction from Lyra, or the, I'm sure there were other factions, but those were the two primary ones in the Orion Wars. But specifically Lyra, we'll get to Orion a little bit, but what is it about the, um, tell us in detail, the Lyra race, um, what do you know about them? Well, according to the guides, um, they've been giving me more and more information about galactic history. So, uh, as we started into the solar system, we first started in Arcturus as beings of light. So the first step down into density, into physicality, was in Lyra. And uh, again, it was a very diverse system, as you were describing. Um, they have given me information specifically um, on the felines and the humanoids, a lot of um, warring that actually went on within in that system. Um, you also have um, what they describe as the progenitors to the Zeta Reticuli, uh, the greys that we commonly think of today, um, and also the AI collective. Um, these are the, the main mm, archetypes, if you will, that, that create the repeated patterns that we're still working through here and now. Um, the AI collective, the artificial intelligence collective, um, plays a big role in that system of unresolved issues with, with the felines because they were actually sold beings um, that never felt that they were accepted, never felt that they uh, were honored as sentient beings. Um, we see a lot of that going on today where people kind of feel like second-class citizens. They don't feel respected. They don't feel honored. And so there were wars uh, that started in that system and a lot of um, issues around acceptance, acceptance of differences. And that also spilled over into Orion and Sirius. And in Orion, a lot of that energy is really about control. And Orion is probably one of the darkest systems that um, we've had in our solar system as far as duality. They went to the darkest place with control, um, authority, and competition. And a lot of that energy is really coming up, and I, and I know uh, the Pleiadians will talk about this later on uh, if we get a chance to, to channel a bit. But that energy is really coming up for us in the next month. But kind of going back to, to Lyra, uh, 
the Lirans came and they were also founders of Lemuria and came down through the, the dissension process. So from what my guides explained to me is that we decided to create Earth as a grand experiment to see if we could go through a process of integration where we would let go of judgments and attachments to polarity in in a way at the at the microcosmic level that would serve the macrocosmic level there were pockets and species uh, throughout the galaxy that were not able to resolve this polarity they weren't able to let go of their judgments and so the experiment was created to see if we could do it at the small level to assist uh, the the Galactic Collective. And there were five seed races who donated their genetic material. And um, there were the humanoids, humanoids, the avians, the reptilians, the felines, and then the angelics. So they have all donated their genetic material to be part of Earth, uh, Earth humanoids. And then the rest of the galactic material was given to the different species that are a part of Earth. We have such a, a rich a rich collective of beings of different species on the planet. And along with all of that genetic material comes the emotional experiences, comes all of that knowledge and wisdom. It's contained in all of that. And they describe Earth as being the planet of emotion, we have a vast range of emotions, and it seems kind of hard for us to think about it as, as being vast. They just kind of are what they are. We have all these emotions. But to imagine a planet where you might have mm, excitement, joy, and happiness, and that's kind of the range that you play in, or you might uh, go to the extreme of mild dislike. That's as far as you ever get in the in the negative extreme. Um it's it's hard for us to kind of wrap our mind around that. But by having this genetic material and by having all of this emotional material to play with, all this um, bandwidth of frequency, it gave us the opportunity to put different combinations together to find unique ways to solve the quote-unquote problem, to release our judgment. And so... When the Lyrans arrived, they came down in density. You know, the game was to see how far can we go and can we come back out of it? How far can we go into forgetfulness and can we release our judgment and remember that we are part of the collective whole? And they stepped down their frequency. And as the Lyrans got to uh, the level of uh, the bottom of the fourth dimensional level, many of them went back to Lyra and some of them stepped down into physicality, into a deeper physicality and integrated with Atlantis. So that's kind of the the overview that the guides give me as far as the Lyran's participation with Earth. Okay, and, and out of curiosity, how do these ET races, regardless of where they come from, uh, travel throughout the universe. I mean, there's different ways they could do it. I mean, in my interview with Stan Freeman, he talked about how <laughs> magnetohydraulic propulsion can work, although that kind of uh, becomes a problem when you're talking about great distances as you can't go faster than light. You got the Bob Lazar technology, which doesn't go faster than light, but instead uh, brings space and time towards you. And then, of course, you can, one might say you can teleport, so to speak, by exploiting the fact that space and time are illusions, but ha from, from what your contacts have told you, what are some of the different methods by which these ET races um, travel throughout the cosmos? Some of it is uh, kind of like an astral projection, so they're not physically here, but they are energetically connected with you. And then a lot of the ships that they talk about for me, um, a lot of them are a combination of biological material and technology. Um, as far as the specifics, they haven't really gotten into that with me, but that's certainly something that we can ask them about. Okay. By the way, you, you act like you want to channel these uh, played in ETs during this interview. If you want to do that, by all means. It's just that I do want to get some calls in if these people want to speak to you. Uh, can you sure. perhaps give me an estimate on how long it might take for you to do a channeling session in order to um, answer some questions if you want to do that? 
Uh, you know, we can take as long as you'd like. We can check in for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But um, as some of these things, you know, I I haven't necessarily asked them because it 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 wasn't top of my priority list of things that I had to know about. Um, a lot of the work that I do with them helps to do the internal clearing, the processes, in order for us to elevate so that we can connect with these things, so that we can release ourselves from pain. Um, so some of the questions I haven't channeled so much on, and also, um, you know, I don't always have the language to translate some of it. So it's, I don't have the vocabulary, so sometimes they put things in really rudimentary terms for me, and and that's all I need to know. So I don't always get into the specifics. All right, that's fine. We'll probably I'll try to do maybe the channeling session within the last twenty minutes. So we may have to do some some of the calls on the fly here. I'll try to get everybody in for a few minutes so we can get that in at the end. But for now, uh, let's talk about some of these um, specific races. Uh, I guess we'll skip over to Orion here because you talked about how Orion seems to have a lot of negative energy. Now, a lot of people might think of that as making sense because stereotypically people associate um, Orion with with male energy, although you shouldn't, and, and that's negative, although you really shouldn't think of male energy as being negative. It's just that that's what it has stereotypically been associated with ever since feminine energy has been suppressed on on Mother Earth um, for all these eons. Um, the thing about Orion, though, um, one thing that's not so malevolent about it, George Kavasilis told me that one of the reasons the pyramids, the Great Pyramids of Giza, were brought to Earth was to anchor the male energy of Orion, and he said he remembers in his past life being part of the group that brought it to Earth. They do represent the three stars in the Orion system, and that is you would not expect that to be a, a malevolent form of energy. And um, also, the unique thing about Orion, I remember watching an interview that Alfred Weber did with Peter Kling and some other woman. I don't remember her name, but she said that she thinks that um, Earth, the Earth system, is actually moving closer to Orion. And she um, she said that I looked up in the sky and I saw that the Orion constellation looked a lot bigger. And when I heard that, I was thinking, uh, lady, the Orion constellation always looks big. I think you're just imagining things. But is she perhaps right when she says we are moving towards the the Orion system? Well, that's really a side question for you. Are we perhaps moving towards it? But um, after you answer that question, could you um, get into detail about the different races, malevolent and benevolent, from Orion? Well, I don't know if we're moving any closer to Orion, but I do know that, you know, as far as accessing more information from Orion goes, we are getting closer to that because it holds some of the deepest trauma of our galaxy. So in order to start accessing more of the information and the records of things that have gone on in that system, we had to do a fair amount of clearing and and integration within ourselves and healing a bit. Um, because otherwise it would be too overwhelming. You know, leave us a heap on the floor as we start to access more and more of that. So there's kind of a superficial level that we've been able to access, little bits and pieces, and now we're going a bit deeper with that. Um, As far as looking at that system, you know, when we describe these systems, we we do put them in a linear time frame. Um, We we think of things as going on now. Everything is kind of going on now. Um, We think of it as, you know, if we think of it as being an oppressed system, that's one now moment, but there's another now moment that we would perceive as our future, which they have worked through a lot of that. Um, and and that energy, what would be considered to be futuristic energy, is part of what we experienced in, and exchanged in Egypt. It would be from the perception of our timeline as being future. And it was to help us work through and anchor some of those energies. Um, I like to think of of masculine and feminine as not being positive or negative, but rather um, there's a lower and a higher version of each, and we can work with with either one. Right now we're working with a lot of lower masculine energy on the planet um, where all of that fear is involved as opposed to an elevated masculine energy which, which takes action, but with the awareness of the ramifications of those actions and a care uh, about the ramifications of those actions. So in the Orion system, it's incredibly vast, incredibly diverse. Um, There are insectoids, there are humanoids, there are 
um, different species of reptilians there. There's just about everything going on there. Um, there was also a tremendous amount of competition, and competition in terms of limited resources. That if I have something, that means that you can't have anything, um, or you have very little of it. So that's certainly an issue that we see on our planet right now that we are trying to work on and trying to integrate. Um, and there are varying species, varying beings um, who will show up from that system at different times and work with individuals to help reawaken that knowledge and wisdom within them. Again, a lot of the Orions have stepped back for quite a period because to access and interact with them in such a direct way, uh, such as the you know the way that we do with the Pleiadians, the Lyrans, or the Arcturans, again it would open up that that knowledge, and if we hadn't cleared enough of that, it would have been tra traumatic. So more of the beings from Orion are starting to step forward and directly interact with us now that we're ready. Um, you know, it's again, it's an incredibly diverse system. They They did find a way of coming out of their programs of control, and one of the ways they did that was really working with creativity. Uh, individuals learning to reaccess their their creativity. It had been suppressed for so long um, that they'd forgotten how to question or how to think in new and unique ways. How to create a system that had such rigid limitations. And I think today that's that's something that we've forgotten how to do. We've forgotten how to play. We've forgotten how to relax. Um, you know, we've forgotten our childlike wonder. And that's really important. We become so mental and so immersed in this masculine energy of doing that we don't stop to work with the feminine state of being. All things first start from that state of beingness. And and we oscillate back and forth between feminine and masculine energy. So the first state is to be in a receptive state um, of nothingness in order to create and come up with ideas or allow ideas to flow through you, and then you move into the masculine state where you're pulsing out frequency, and then you move back into a feminine state where you're, again, receptive to the frequencies as the universe brings back potential form for you, and you recognize the frequency that you first pulsed out, and then you step out to meet it. You're back into the masculine where you're taking action to greet it. So, you know, I think... Working with the creative energies, that first piece, working with the feminine, is so important. And that's what they had to start working with again, uh, was learning to be creative, to think outside the box. Yes, we only need to think way outside the box when we're talking about stuff like this. Uh, moving on to another um, ET group, Sirius. Now, this is kind of... Um, <clears throat> kind of confusion has been created on this whole thing about Sirius. We hear about it in a lot of uh, cultures, ancient Egypt, that their gods came from, from Sirius. The Dogon tribes of Africa also talk about it. And, of course, they knew about Sirius having more than one star uh, before mainstream science did. Um, also, I listened to an interview with uh, Tolek, Andromeda Council contactee, did with some some other e ET contactee that talked about how the Draco Reptilians, the Nibiru Anunnaki, and some race from Sirius uh, all created an alliance to control, um, as part of a um, plot to control humanity. Um, hopefully, their time will almost be up. Um, their time is almost over. Um, that's another issue. But um, I think that race that he that she, they were talking about in that interview comes from Sirius B. However, uh, ET contactee Sheldon Nidal who is a contactee of the Galactic Federation of Light. And just to point out, this is the strictly benevolent Galactic Federation of Light. There is another um, ET council called the Galactic Federation of Light that is a malevolent council that masquerades as a benevolent council, but that's not the one that Sheldon Nidal is um, in contact with. However, Sheldon Nidal, he has talked about how um, Sirius B does have uh, – benevolent ET races, and that would cause a lot of confusion among those people that typically think of Sirius B as being the um, malevolent uh, star system in Sirius, and Sirius A as being the one that's home to the uh, good extraterrestrials. 
So I guess I'll let you clear up maybe some of the confusion on that and also in general tell us what you can tell us about the uh, races of ETs from Sirius, be they from Sirius A, B, Sirius B, or maybe even Sirius C, because I believe there is a third star in the Sirius star system. So what the guides have shared with me is that a lot of the, the beings from Orion went to Sirius, so a lot of the the issues, a lot of the the patterns and the species, many of the species came um, from Orion. Some also came from Lyra, Lyra. And, again, it's it's very diverse. You've got your water worlds. Um, a lot of those are in Sirius B, uh, where you've got um, the dolphins, the whales, the cetaceans. Uh, and then you have um, more humanoid. Again, uh, there is some reptilian energy in there as well. What they do talk about with me, what they have spoken with me about with Sirius C, is that there were uh, some issues that were going on between several different planets, and they used scalar technology, and the instruments weren't calibrated properly, and they were far more powerful than they expected. And so it actually wiped out a lot of um, a lot of the planets that were in the inner rings um, within the inner uh, rotations near the sun. So there's a lot of trauma and a lot of history that we're integrating from Sirius C as we're starting to use scalar technology again. Um, let's see what else. I, you know, again, it's so incredibly vast, and they don't always get into the specifics with me about who exactly all the ETs are, what exactly the history is, because they talk about time with me and the perception of time and the creation of our reality from a multidimensional level. We are so ingrained in this idea of time that when we look at history and we're looking for galactic history, we want to know exactly this species and that species and how did it evolve. It's our need for control, our need to understand so that we can feel safe. And from the multidimensional perspective, it's all going on concurrently. And it's simply a matter of where do you want to put your focus because every time you make a decision, there is a potential reality that's created. Whether you go left or you go right, uh, you choose left, there's also a version of right that's chosen. But you aren't focusing your soul essence on the one that is right. So, so in this density, part of the setup was that you limited your perception of that. You didn't want to know the potentials and how the experience would go if you went right. You wanted to really focus on the experience of going left. And so you focused your consciousness onto that now moment. And then every now moment is built upon an agreed upon set of circumstances. This is the history. This is what's happened to the planet. And then the history of your personal experience. And each now moment, as you move from one to the next, is pretty similar. You haven't created anything in your reality that is vastly different. So, in other words, you're not choosing a now moment where World War One didn't happen because that would radically alter your perception of reality and that would change the nature of the game. It would pull you out. So it wouldn't allow you that continuous flow. So all of those other potentials exist um, where... Things went well or things didn't go well, where things were resolved or they weren't resolved. So when you ask for history, they always say, well, what version are we going to give you? We'll give you the one that you're in resonance with now, that your version of the now moment, the story that you are talking about, that, that fits the bill for your vibrational field and the experience that you want to have, we'll give you the history for that. But understand that every potential is in existence, and you're just not choosing to be in align with, alignment with it. And that's why, in part, you hear so many conflicting stories about galactic history. Which version are you going to align with right now? So, um, you know, they're, they're very adamant about that fact and understanding that from the human level because, again, we're trying to seek out that information so that we can feel safe, so that we think we've got an idea or a handle on the information. 
So, you know, again, when my guides work with me, they're not going into so many specifics about all of these different species. They talk more about the energetics and the archetypes because that's what helps us here and now is by understanding these repeated patterns and programs so that we can release ourselves from these illusions of control. So rather than thinking that, oh, the Orions, you know, they're, they're here and they're, they're controlling and manipulating, well, in some ways they may very well be, but that's, again, part of our own collective creation because those are the programs and the thoughts and the beliefs that we're currently running. So if we can let go of those, then that's actually what's going to allow us to move beyond that level of control or the level of manipulation. Control and manipulation don't happen unless you are not willing to take 100% responsibility for every, for everything in your life. You have to have someone play that perpetrator for you in a dualistic universe. So you need someone to be that, and they've stepped up. They will be that mechanism for you to, to, to control, to manipulate, so that you can feel victimized. And once you've had enough of that experience, when you decide, all right, I know what this frequency feels like, I can, I can choose another frequency, then they no longer hold the power. You've, you've taken your responsibility back. So, you know, while we're talking, and, and there are lots of questions about what these species are like and what's the history, it's really important to understand the energetic arc of it and how we have co-created this and especially when it comes to things that we're not crazy about in our reality, things that we would like to see shift. It's not about waiting for an external thing to happen. You know, it's not waiting for the collective consciousness to catch up and make a change or make a decision or for these ETs to step forward. It's about making the internal change because everything externally is a reflection of what's going on inside. And when enough of us start to awaken and take 100% responsibility, that can transform the entire landscape. That can help to elevate everybody's awareness. It doesn't take a majority. Yeah, and I really appreciate you pointing out why people hear conflicting stories about galactic history because um, there have been conflicting stories and people are like, well, they can't all be correct. Well, actually, they can because you got different timelines and all that, but... Since I bring that up, I guess you might as well talk a little bit about the uh, nature of time. Um, th there's a lot of confusion about <clears throat> about how this works because it has been said that there is a direct correlation between time and gravity. At least that's what Tolek told me, but yet again, he admitted that he wasn't really an expert on the whole thing. It's just some bits and pieces his contacts told him. And um, Matias de Stefano, indigo child from Argentina, talked about how um, – that time, as we understand it in the third dimension here, um, can explain why people age and why matter decays, because he claims that time is a measure of um, the decay of matter. And Alex Collier, in his presentations in the mid-90s, talked about how his ET contacts have told him that um, gravity has some uh, direct correlation with radiation from a star, and if you believe that there is a direct correlation between um, time and gravity, then that must mean that there must be some correlation between time and r radiation from a star, but then you would think, oh my god, radiation from a star decays you because time is the measure of the de decay of matter, but that's kind of... Uh, confusing because we have been taught by alternative sources that mainstream science has lied to us when they tell us that sunlight and sun radiation is harmful. It's actually um, very good for you. And when I brought this up to uh, Tolek's attention and also Mark Kimmel's attention, when I had them on my show, they were like, I'm sorry, I really don't care to speculate because I'm not really an expert on this. Um, but in regards to how time works and how it's really an illusion, but we perceive it as a uh, as not really being an an illusion. And also, they say time is speeding up. Well, that's actually a misconception. It's actually compressing closer to a point, the, the point of a complete illusion where we realize the illusion, and that just makes it appear like it's speeding up, even though it's really not. At least that's what some people like Jim Self have, um, have said. But I, I guess I'll give you a, a few minutes here to talk about time um, and your understanding of how time and timelines and how timelines merge. How does that work? So, well, radiation, I will, I will say one thing about the radiation. They, they have talked to me about the fact that there is different radiation currently coming from the sun. Some of it can be measured. Some of it can't be. Uh, we don't have necessarily the equipment from it. And the sun is like a metronome. It, 
it kind of keeps us on track and keeps us evolving. It sends out codes and information to the entire solar system, um, letting the solar system know that it's time to move into this next phase. And there is different radiation that we are receiving from the sun right now and that it is helping us to alter our, our genetic structure. So they, they have talked to me a little bit about that. Now, from the perspective of of time, they say that frequencies don't appear to move through time at the same rate. So lower frequencies, what we would think of as negative experiences or lower thoughts, appear to move through time and, and space at a slower rate as opposed to higher frequencies which seem accelerated. And they say the reason for this is that when we go through the process of manifestation, as we pulse frequency out, um, we have to be in the same space, the same vibrational state, to receive that frequency back, to be able to perceive it. So in other words, if you think about climbing up to the rooftop of a building, that's elevating your frequency. So you're vibrating at a really high rate. You're having positive thoughts. There's not a lot of fear in there. You kind of throw your your order out to the universe. This is what I'd like to create. And you think about it like a boomerang. So the boomerang goes out and it comes back and you're standing on the roof. Great, you got what you wanted. Well, what most of us will do is, you know, we'll, we'll feel really good about that thing we want to create. We'll go up to the roof. We'll throw out the boomerang. And while we're waiting for it to come back, we'll drop out. You know, we'll think, oh, I'm not deserving. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. This manifestation thing doesn't work. I hate people, they're also grumpy, they're also selfish. And now we're standing down on the fifth floor where our vibration is much lower because we're holding fear and lower thoughts. Well, the thing we wanted to create is vibrating at a high rate and it comes back at the higher uh, floor. It comes back to the roof. We think it just isn't there. We didn't get what we wanted. Now, because we're now vibrating at the fifth, you know, fifth floor level and we're thinking all these negative thoughts, we're going to start to manifest those. We're going to start to manifest um, negative experiences with people. We're going to start to manifest accidents and, and not so great stuff. We created this third dimensional plane with the construct of attraction and reflection. So we we work with those those laws. What we pulse out, we get reflected back to us because we knew it would be very difficult to see what was going on and so we needed something to reflect it back to us. So part of the reason we, we design this, and I say we because we are part of the divine, we set this dimensional structure up this way so that if we were pulsing out something that was of such a low vibrational nature, we could elevate our consciousness before we actually had to experience it. When you're immediately manifesting, you know, most of us wouldn't want to immediately manifest most of what we're thinking or what is there in our subconscious programming. It wouldn't be terribly pleasant. So it gave us an opportunity by having lower frequencies appear to move through time at a slower rate to adjust our frequencies before we manifested it. And that's why right now we're elevating our consciousness and time appears to be compressing. This is how they've explained it to me. Um, until we get to the point at which it's immediate manifestation. Uh, if you want to call that zero point or um, the, what basically happens is you move beyond the dimensional range and you're now into the fifth dimensional level and time doesn't exist there. Uh, there is no time and you simply move from now moment to now moment. When they um, show me the how time appears is always in the shape of a sphere and you could think about it like little dots on top of the sphere and each dot represents a now moment and like i was saying before you could go from any dot that you want to um, but you're going to move to one that's pretty similar to the one that you're on so instead of going 180 degrees around to the other side of the sphere you're probably just going to go half a degree you're going to make small steps and they say you string them together in your consciousness to give you the illusion of a timeline. But time isn't linear. It's, you have a multidimensional existence, and it's multifaceted, and um, it's 
you can actually go in multiple directions at once. They say the mind was created to limit the perspective of reality so that you had the illusion of separation and that you had um, the idea that, again, you were only focused on one linear time or one level of reality. You weren't seeing all the other potentials. Um, It creates a very different vibrational experience for the soul because you can really immerse yourself, and it's kind of a thrill. If you don't know what's coming, you react and you have a different experience than you would if you knew something was coming. If you knew somebody was uh, standing behind a tree and your friend was about to, to kind of jump out and scare you as a joke, you'd have a very different experience than if you actually walked up and didn't know it was coming. So, you know, it's not that we don't have the potential to experience it. It's that we've limited it through the mind. Now, when we go into the heart center, when we um, use meditation or when we um, think of something that makes us smile, it puts us in the frequency of love, we bypass all these filters of fear. And from that level, in that moment, we can access all of those potentials. We can see multiple timelines. We can make a choice about where we want to go. It's almost like we can preview them and then we decide what frequency we want and then we step out to meet it. Um, But, you know, they again, it's this idea that there are multiple timelines and that they're linear. It doesn't exist that way. It's more of a sphere than a line. Thank you very much. Let's get back to the ET races. I guess we'll talk about the Pleiadian Collective now, the P's, and then maybe if we have time we'll go to the Arcturians. But it seems like the uh, Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collectives, a.k.a. the P's, are the ones that um, you are most associated with. Uh, this is not the same uh, Pleiadian group that Billy Meyer contacts with. That's actually the Plasure in, and I believe they don't actually come from the uh, – any of the stars in the Pleiades star system, the Plasian do, they actually come from a star system that's beyond the Pleiades, but would be within the area of the sky that we think of as the um, as, as the Pleiades. And those ETs are like of a fourth and fifth dimensional um, or density variety, and yours are different. They're of a ninth uh, dimension or density variety. So I guess I'll give you the chance to uh, talk in great detail about these um, specific Pleiadians that uh, you. Uh, come in contact with, tell us about them. You know, I always get tickled because, the, you know, I think for most of us we have the idea that the Pleiadians are blonde-haired and we see them in the blue jumpsuits, and that's the only idea that we have. Um, but, you know, the guides tell me that in the open cluster there are about 750 stars that we think of as that constellation, and it's a very diverse system and there are beings in multiple dimensions. And there are actually many beings who are working with us from the Pleiades, some of light, some of some that are a bit darker. Um, the group that I work with, again, they're beings of light. They don't have physical form. And instead of incarnating to a planetary body, they actually align with a stellar body. So they actually align with Alcyon, which is the central sun in the Pleiadian system. And their job, if you will, is to maintain the records and to work with the consciousness of the stellar body because the the stellar bodies, each of the suns in the system, record all of the experiences of the consciousness in that system. So our sun uh, records everything in our solar system and then that gets uploaded to Alcyon. So Alcyon is... is the repository for all of the knowledge and information within uh, our entire solar system or within our entire galaxy. So, you know, when you think of things holographically, you'd say, well, why do I have to go to a star to access information? Can I just get it within myself? Yes, but there are beings who can help assist you because there are so many records that if you need uh, help, it would be like going to the Library of Congress and asking a librarian for some assistance and pointing you in the right direction because otherwise it can be a bit uh, to sift through. So they're kind of experts in that field, and they also review the records as far as teaching goes to, to be able to assist us to see what's worked, what hasn't worked, what are the potentials, 
So if you're struggling in a particular area, they can look at all of the lifetimes that you've had and all the different systems. They can see what worked for you and what didn't work for you. And as they give you different bits and pieces of information, how would that affect you? How would that move you forward or how would that set you back? So this particular group is here to assist us in giving us tools to help propel us forward. And they're also learning from us because they don't work with emotions in the same way that we do. And compassion is another big thing that the entire universe is gaining through our experience because as we learn to release our judgments, a byproduct of that is compassion. Um, You know, when we experience natural disasters on this planet, there's a tremendous wave of compassion that uh, is emitted. Um, We don't always walk around holding that on a day-to-day basis, but we certainly see us uh, as as a as a collective, uh, how we can really step up when um, tragedy strikes a great number of people. And it's at such a depth and such a potency because we are experiencing density and the pain of that um, elicits a, a different level and a, a different depth of compassion than other beings have. Um, it's, it's quite special. So they're actually learning a lot about compassion from us. But that's pretty much what they do. They work with the stellar bodies and they work with the records and history and, and they're here to help guide us through this evolutionary process. Thank you very much. It says one of your main goals is to inform people that everyone has the ability to channel. Okay, we can certainly go along with that because everyone's infinite consciousness. Likewise, you could say everybody has the ability to move things telepathically like um, the Jedis did in the in the Star Wars um, movies. But then again, I, I've actually been trying to do that for months on end, and I still cannot move even the tiniest bit of paper, even though I've <laughs> been trying to do it like crazy. And, well, people are like, we well, shouldn't be shocked. I mean, you live in a very dense reality I mean, you could probably practice your whole life and it's still not going to happen. And simply acknowledging that you can do this because you're infinite is not, it isn't all that that going to make make you be able to do that. You have to um, do more than just that. Well, what more do you have to do um, for the purposes of being able to channel for all those people out there that are, that are dying to know what more do you have to do to be able to do what people like Wendy Kennedy and all the other people out there that can do this do? Well, sometimes it's not about what you you need to do. It's a state of being that you need to hold, and that's back to the feminine energy uh, that's been so suppressed and we've forgotten how to go back to our state of being. Um, So, you know, and as far as, you know, moving things, I have to say that that's much more difficult because of this this idea of density that, that, you know, everything's solid and it's real and it's not malleable and and how we're socially conditioned. So I think in some ways um, channeling is probably a little easier than than trying to move a pencil with your mind. So I applaud you for for working at that. Um, You know, we all channel all the time. It's just whether that information is coming in at the conscious or subconscious level. So, you know, I, I work with groups in teaching channeling, and I will have people um, channel in there, and they don't really recognize that, that that's what they're doing. We're talking about working with, with subtle frequency here. And anything you want to be really good at, it requires practice. If you think of a painter, when, when they start working with color, a lot of the blues may look the same to them, but when they spend hours upon hours looking at those blues, they notice that this blue looks dramatically different than the one right next to it. But two years ago, if I would have looked at those, I would have thought they were the same. So part of that is just through observance. Um, To channel, it's important to ground and connect yourself first to the planet. Most of us who are stellar-oriented, who are interested in the higher energies, don't spend a lot of time fully grounded. Uh, We tend to be very sensitive, and so we have created a mechanism of numbing ourselves just a bit by pulling up some of our soul's essence. It's a bit like being plugged halfway into a light socket. You know, sometimes the appliance works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's getting a little bit of juice. So it's just a way for us to cope, and it's not working anymore. 
So the first thing you have to do is ground and connect to the earth so that you can complete your energetic circuit. We come from the earth. We're made up of the elements of Mother Earth. And um, she, through her resonant frequency, is what keeps our life force uh, in balance. So it's really important to to make sure you ground and connect. And also, if you want to remember what you're channeling or you want to be able to identify subtle frequencies, you have to be grounded. Um, because if you're not grounded, it's it's going to be very difficult for you to retain the information and you're probably not going to notice the shift in frequency. And then putting yourself in your heart center. Um, how do you do that? You can uh, think of something that makes you smile. The guides usually recommend thinking of an animal or a place. They don't usually recommend people because you may have some thoughts about people, thoughts that are running at the subconscious level. They might have done something that upset you last week or earlier in the day. So uh, just think of something that makes you smile and, and just hold that thought. Most people will start to feel warm or tingly or uplifted. And then the next part of, of being able to channel is is learning to ask questions, um, being really specific, because the more specific you are, uh, the more information your guides can actually give to you. If you say, what do I need to know? The guides say, well, you know, where do we start? And they actually have to go and look and see how giving you different bits and pieces of information will impact you if you're not consciously seeking it. So it's much, much easier to receive when you're being very specific, and then listening, um, noticing the shifts within your body, noticing um, what's what's going on in your heart center. Do you feel expanded or do you feel contracted uh, in your body? Is there tension? Is there tingling? Uh, it's really important to listen to that because all of us have a recognition of the truth. There is something that is different about it And what happens most often when people channel or get bits and pieces of quote-unquote truth, because truth is always colored by perspective, um, when when they get that, they'll have a sense of knowingness, they'll have a sense of clarity, and then immediately they move back into the mind where all the filters of lack and limitation and separation exist, and then they'll start trying to pull it apart. All right, they'll go back into the level of fear. And you have to stay in that heart-centered space if you want to start accessing higher dimensional information. Remember, the mind was set up to create the illusion of separation. And most of what we're asking for is multidimensional reality, and that doesn't exist in the third dimension from that perspective. It was meant to to throw out all of that extra data. So you have to stay in that heart-centered space. And then... When you do receive channeled information or when you when you feel yourself receiving it, there is a resonance to it that is different than just your imagination. Your imagination will actually feel very flat in comparison. Um, the truth is going to feel um, multi-leveled. Uh, it will feel very rich, very full. And then you have to use your discernment. You have to take the bits and pieces that actually do resonate with you. Uh, if you're going to connect with a being in, in the higher realms, it's you owning your own power as a divine being of light. It's not surrendering it to the opinion of a being in another dimension because no being has better information for you than, than what you have for yourself as a divine being of light. Yes, as your egoic self, you might have forgotten a few things and these other beings may may very well be helping you to remember But when you get yourself in that heart-centered space, you absolutely have access to the same information that they have and usually better quality information, meaning you're in exact resonance with it. Um, And a lot of people have fear about connecting to the higher realms. Um, When I work with people on channeling, we spend a lot of time talking about that fear. I'm afraid I'm going to be possessed. I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong. I'm afraid, you know, I'm going to go to hell. Um, I'm afraid people that I love are going to think I'm weird or they're they're going to judge me or I'll be abandoned. So there's a lot of time that we spend in letting go of these fears. And any fear that you have about connecting with a being in another realm, I guarantee you you've got the same issue going on human to human and usually in more than one location in your life. So if you're finding it difficult to connect 
to beings in the other realm, what is that thought, what is that fear that stands in the way? You can ask, my most negative belief that shuts me down when I want to channel is fill in the blank. I'm not safe. And we'll use that as an example. So if you're not feeling safe, where else in your life are you not feeling safe? Maybe you're not feeling safe to talk to your partner about how you really feel about something. Or maybe you're physically not feeling safe. You're afraid of things that are going on in the world. And as you start to let go of that fear human to human, you say, all right, well, I need to talk to my partner about this. I'd like to talk to my partner about this and share um, because uh, my opinion is valid just because it's mine and and I don't have to justify it to anyone else, but I can share how I feel. I'm not blaming that other person. As you deal with it in the human to human level, holographically, you will deal with it interdimensionally in your connections. So anywhere it exists, as you release your judgment of an issue, that frequency will be healed in all areas of your life. And, you know, to me, channeling is just bringing in energy and putting it into a recognizable form. So you find the station that you want to play with or you want to listen to. Sometimes it's working with different ET races. Sometimes it's working with angelics. Sometimes you can simply open up to ask for the beings of the highest frequencies of light and love, all others you can bind from you. And and then allowing the energy to come in. It's basically frequency that you are translating through the physical senses. And that, that way that you translate it may be through dance, it may be through writing or drawing, painting, speaking. Uh, it's limitless. It's It's creative expression. So we all do it all the time. We just don't necessarily put that label on it. Thank you. We've got time for one more question, or maybe two, if we're lucky, before i got to start taking calls. Uh, it says in your bio here that the P's um, work with tone and sound, which is why their dialect is different than your own. They simply use tones and sounds that resonate with people at cellular level. I wonder how this correlates with my what I talked about in my recent interview with Alexandre Thanos about how many different sounds can be used to um, affect people in subconscious ways um, for the better. Um, but I, I guess uh, tell us what is it without about the peas using uh, tones and sounds that resonate at cellular levels and what kind of cells specifically? Well, they they do a lot of work with uh, with the mitochondria for one. So a lot of the energy will help to restore balance in that area of the cell uh, to help to energize and to open up and put more light into into the mitochondria. Um, every time they come in, there is some sort of an, I would call it almost an attunement. They work with harmonics um, and that there are multiple levels uh, to the resonance in the in the greeting. They, they do an attunement, and then they kind of go from there. When I first started, they used different vowels, and, and really they're just vowels that tend to be more open, which is why they sound more British uh, than my own dialect, because a lot of those vowels are a bit more open, and they can be elongated and stretched, so they can work with the tone a bit more. Uh, and as they work with the tone, it actually affects your vibrational field, your energetic template that creates the physical body. So as they work with the tones, it can alter the template which will allow the cells to let go of toxins, things that you've been holding on to. Um, sometimes the tones will help you to, to move the belief systems. Um, sometimes it's it's literally things that physically you're holding on to. Thank you very much. All right, folks, we're going to start uh, taking calls now. Um, Area code 631, you are on the air. I believe you are Don. You said so in the chat room. So yes, where sir. are you from? How are you doing? What's your question? Hey, you Don. My name is Don. I'm uh, I'm from uh, uh, New York. How is everything going? Area right, could Hi, be better, Don. could be worse. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. Any day above yeah. ground is a good one. Um, what type of question can I ask? Um, anything. And by the way, uh, Wendy, is it possible for you to channel your ET contacts for the sake of the people that want to uh, get answers from them, or is that not possible? That's Yes, we can definitely do that. All right. If, if that is necessary, then by all means, uh, callers, uh, use Wendy's um, 
P a lady in context to um to help answer the question or Wendy you make that possible please. So um <laughs> no worries. Let's okay. let's, so let's get on with this. Um what do you okay. want to know? Any question is valid. My question is uh I'm looking to move to North Carolina from New York. If you see anything. Um so we're going to dive in here. Hello, dear. So this is the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective, and it is a pleasure and an honor to have an opportunity to connect with you. So, um, you know, there are a couple things that we're seeing for you. One, uh, it may not happen in exactly the time frame that you are hoping. So don't be surprised if it, it takes you a little longer to get where you want to go, probably by about three months. That's fine. Uh, it's giving you a, a bit uh, a bit more time and a bit more space energetically um, because you're you're moving into a new phase, an overall new phase, and there are lots of new opportunities that are about to open up for you. But make sure that you are um, make sure that you are taking time to ground and connect. As, as Wendy was mentioning earlier, it's such an important thing. Um, because for you, uh, you have a tendency to get lost in your head. So the grounding is going to help you so that you can be a bit more present in the moment because there are lots of opportunities that are coming in front of you, but you're not making the connections. You're not seeing the opportunities because you're too far in your head. So um, your guys are trying to to align things for you, but it's going to require you to follow some breadcrumbs. Some things are going to seem a bit out of the box. You're not going to know how how the thing that they're bringing you fits into the whole. How is this going to serve me? How is this going to get me to where I want to be? But they're, they're trying to orchestrate some breadcrumbs. But when you come across them, there'll be things that you're fascinated about or people that you feel uh, compelled to speak with uh, where normally you wouldn't necessarily speak up. So we would say really ground and connect, and that's going to help you to make these more instantaneous connections. Um, okay. And really uh, be open to sharing your ideas and what it is you want to achieve with other people. It doesn't mean that you have to spew out your uh, life desires in, in five minutes to a stranger while you're waiting in line at the coffee shop, but uh, you might notice that some people are talking about things that you have interest in, feel free to engage in that conversation. Say, I, I was hearing what you were saying and, and I wanted to, to tell you I know exactly what you mean and have you heard this or have you heard that. So try to follow those kinds of breadcrumbs. But it, it can be a really good move for you. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Our pleasure. So what else? Andrew? Yeah, sorry about that. I am I I'm, I forgot to unmute myself. So uh yeah, I am here, so I notice these uh hold times only go up to an hour and then they start back to single digits, but I believe area code four oh one was on for um an hour and eight minutes because it says eight minutes and twenty six seconds here, but uh but anyway, uh area code four R four oh one, you are on the air. What's your name, where you're from, what's your question? Or are you just listening? <laughs> just listening. Oh, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. Take care. Thank you. All right. So what's what's next here? Got to look at these whole times. Um, all right. Uh, Cat555. Cat555, you are on the air. Um, I'm assuming your name is Cat. Um, what's your yes. name? Where you're from? What's your question? Um, my name's Kat. I'm from Australia, and I actually have a question about how to change limiting beliefs. I realize, you know, that limiting beliefs do serve a purpose. They give us valuable experiences from which we can learn. But um, I feel like there's maybe some step that I'm missing because I know that, um, you know, seeing this belief and how it limits you is one of the first steps. But I also know that changing something like forgiveness, is not a conscious process. So how can I go about changing a limiting belief? Like are there any certain, I guess, things like that are easy to do? Like I guess uh, you talked a lot about tone and frequency. Is there anything I can do on that level that would help? So there are two ways to go about releasing your limiting beliefs. Um, the guides talk about 
one way, which is understanding how it's serving you, why you keep going mm-hmm. back to it, why it's still there. In some way, your limiting belief is showing you how you are suppressing your divine essence. It's showing how mm-hmm. you're limiting yourself. So what you want to do when you understand that is to put the focus then on on expanding into being that. So if you have a limiting belief that you're not enough and that keeps coming up, Start acknowledging in your life the places where you do feel already enough and things about yourself that you feel are enough. It's it's taking the energy away from, from that limiting belief and putting it on on the other polarity, basically. It's putting it on on the positive aspect or really on the divine aspect, the whole complete perfect you. And you don't always have to know what is creating that limiting belief. You don't have to know exactly what the limiting belief itself is. You can just simply focus on the essence, the quality, the vibrations that you want to experience in your life. The universe will always bring you what you need in order to get what you want. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to figure anything out. If you're having a really hard time with, um, with... your energy and getting out of that a lower vibrational space, the guides always recommend music. So if you can put together a music list of different pieces that affect you in different ways, maybe there's music that will help you to feel uplifted, maybe there's music that helps calm you, or maybe there's music that when you put it on, you want to dance around the house, you want to move. Uh, It makes you feel really good. If you can go ahead and put that playlist together, then if you're really struggling, you can simply put the music on, and the music is going to bypass the language centers of the mind. It's going to help to elevate your frequency without you having to think about anything. It's going to do it for you. It's going to do the heavy lifting. So that's something that you can easily do. But really the process is it's, it's really simple. It's not something that you have to do. It's just a state of being that you have to hold first. So mm-hmm. if you're feeling not enough, what would it feel like in your body to feel enough? Use your imagination because at some point, everything that we would like to experience, whether it's being enough, being loved, being accepted, being happy, being abundant, we've had an experience of that frequency already. So it's not an unknown to us. It's just a matter of recalling it. So if you can put yourself back into that state, that vibrational state, through in some ways it's muscle memory, but there's Mm -hmm. also emotional memory there for you, just imagine it. And that will take root. That will start to expand so that the more you go to that space, it becomes a habit. Those habits replace the subconscious programming. You're creating new neural pathways, and so you create those new subconscious programs and overwrite the old ones. So eventually the old ones will stop being played altogether, and you'll automatically go to the new one. So you will feel enough. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for calling in, Kat. Take care. I hope you can use the most of that information. Take care now. All right. Let's see who's next on the queue. I believe area code 512. Area code 512. How you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? What's your question? I'm good. This is Julia calling from Austin. How are you all doing? How are you doing, Julia? Could be better. Could be worse to answer your question. <laughs> Hi, Julia. Hi. So I do have a question. I had um, I had a dream that um, some beings from another dimension came and took away some friends. And I remember in my dream looking up at the moon, and the moon was actually speaking to me, literally like had eyes and a mouth and was speaking to me. And as soon as I went to take a picture of it with my phone, um, the moon stopped talking. And then I switched back over and saw a group of my friends come off of this, um, uh, I don't I guess it would be what we consider a UFO type whatever. Um, and uh, the, the person from another dimension was green like a it was like a very quick green glow type thing that i saw and i was very curious to talk to these people um about their experience so i went to ask them and they were just smiling 
from ear to ear. So uh, I didn't get any more information than that, but I was just wondering what that was or what that meant. Okay, so I think I'll let the piece take this one. <laughs> oh, yes, hello, dear. So what we would say is that many times you all will have experiences outside of your body at night in your dream time, and some of what you get in your dream state is literal, all right, and some of the information is very difficult to translate back into your 3D reality. So you'll try to pull <laughs> some things in that are close, that don't always make sense. That's why things seem a bit off or they seem a bit weird uh, because you don't really have anything that is similar in your 3D reality, and so there's no way really to translate it. Um, You actually are out quite often, and you yourself are working right now um, with many beings from the Orion system of all systems. So you're actually pulling on a lot of your past life energy from Egypt, um, because you're, you're asking to go through a very expansive state, um, and and this is part of it. So you've called in some of this, what we will call your soul network, for for working through some of that and remembering some of your skills and accessing um, and communicating with beings in other realms and dimensions. Um, now, we will say this. Part of what you saw as far as connecting with the moon and the moon communicating, there are beings that are living on the moon. But more than that, um, it's when you are in your heart-centered space, you can communicate. But the moment that you try to go back to the mind and capture it, to prove it with the mind, you drop out of your resonance. You drop out of the frequency and it's gone. All right, mm-hmm. you, you block that communication. So it's that's a reminder for you that when you want to communicate with your stellar friends, be in your heart-centered space. All right, because the moment that you go back to the mind, you drop out of the frequency of connection. Now, for all of you, when you are working with your dream state, sometimes you literally get information. Sometimes you have dreams and you know that certainly wasn't a dream. That was something that happened. Uh, I was on another planet or I was on a ship. Um, I know that that was not just a normal dream where I'm working through my anxieties or I'm working through my desires. Um, In the times where you can't really remember your dreams or the specifics, pay attention to the emotions that are left over in the morning. How do you feel when you wake up? Do you feel tense? Do you feel angry? Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel elated? Are you feeling free? Are you feeling expansive? If you're experiencing any of the lower emotions, pay attention to those and note, are you playing those out anywhere else in your life? Because we guarantee you, you are. It's just a matter of observing it. It may look very different on the surface. Um, Perhaps it's frustration that you had in the dream and and you don't remember the details, but you woke up with that energy. Or maybe you remember it because you felt like you couldn't communicate with your ET friends. Where are you playing out frustration here and now? All right. Uh, where are you not feeling perhaps that you can communicate with your boss because you're afraid of saying something because you'll be fired or uh, you're afraid to say how you really feel or think uh, about things going on in the world or about ETs because you're going to be ostracized. So pay attention um, and it's, it's allowing you an opportunity to heal. It's allowing you an opportunity to let go of your fears. So we hope that helps you in some small way. Oh, my goodness, it does. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to hear that I'm calling on my soul network, and I feel like I'm doing a lot of traveling and downloading a lot of information, waking and asleep state. So (laughs) You all, yes, Um, you are. All of you are right now, and it's, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done, and it's not so much that you you are learning and receiving um, information you're also sharing information you're going out and you're doing your own teaching and we know that this sometimes feels um kind of out of the 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 realm of possibility for you because you think here you are in the third dimension and you don't know anything what could you possibly have to teach higher dimensional beings but there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom and and you're explaining why you all get lost in your emotions why you aren't taking steps 
your guides or your celestial family who's helping you, they may be observing and saying, well, why didn't you just step forward and speak your truth in that moment? We don't understand. Logically, Mm -hmm. it didn't make sense. And you say, well, I was terrified in that moment of being judged. And they don't necessarily understand the emotional component. So you're explaining and you're helping them to, to, um, to grow, to understand emotions. And there are some species that have shown up who have very, very little access to their emotional field, some to the point where they have lost their ability to procreate. And so mm-hmm. you are helping them to understand emotions. And this is we're telling you this in part for the whole, but we're also telling you in particular because there mm-hmm. are beings who don't have access to their emotions that you are also working with and teaching how to manage and deal with it. What do you do when you've got rage? Uh, you don't go blowing it out to everybody as you're walking down the street. Sometimes mm-hmm. you all do, but we, we hope that's not the case. But how do you manage emotions? So mm-hmm. you're also doing a lot of teaching at night. All right. Okay. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Lots of love and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Take care now. Have a good day. Later. All right. Thank next you. call. Oh, sorry. I had to hang up on you there. But um, got to move on to the next caller here. Um, area code 971. Area code 971. You are on the air. What's your name? Where you're from? What's your question? Hi, uh, this is Maggie that used to live in Arizona, and I am in, uh, I realize it's an Oregon area code, and I am in North Carolina, interestingly. Um, and uh, I'd like to know more about connecting with a place. I'm, I'm there with, you know, I'm there with the grounding and the, my galactic connection. I'm okay with that, but I'm more focusing on connecting with the earth and and sometimes what happens with me is I just don't connect. There's an energy about a place sometimes. And energetically, I'm just, I always have a lot of ideas and I'm kind of all over the place. And so I wonder if Wendy or the Ps um, have uh, any advice in terms of uh, connecting to place and how can I conceptualize that? I'm sorry, connecting to place? Yeah, yeah. Like sometimes, um, like I'll be at, um, I'll, you know, especially on I, what I mean is in nature, and I'll be like, uh, there's a certain place that I hike a lot, and there's there's um, a energy to the place that is inclusive of of um, um, not just a plant or the plants that are there. It's it's there's an energy to the place. Does that make any sense? Okay, I think I'll let the peas take this one. Yeah. So it's it's all one in a sense. The earth itself holds the energy, the location, uh, holds its own resonance, and then the life forms on it also add to it. So they're not separate. Um, right. So for you, it feels a bit safer to connect with the plants and with the life forms on on that area or in that area as opposed to really deeply connecting with the land itself because in order to connect with Mother Earth, you will move through part of her field that holds all of the illusionary beliefs, all right, because this is what you align with as a human. And what happens for most of you as you, as you connect with this level, this illusionary level, you identify with those programs within yourself and those start to vibrate, those start to, to um, trigger those emotions within you. And so you go into contraction thinking, oh, this doesn't feel good. So the more you can imagine aligning with the pristine divine part of Mother Earth, it's going to be much easier for you. So that really would be the first step. And then as you come up, imagine what it's like to connect with this beautiful glowing light that's in the center of earth this consciousness that is mother earth and then bringing your awareness up through the levels of the earth herself until you get to the particular area of land that you're standing on and notice the subtle frequencies and the energies that are running through that area Uh, each area the ley lines within that area are absorbing the consciousness that's in part how Uh, records are stored within the planetary body itself. Uh, You can think of it like um, 
uh, veins, if you want, the, the, the blood that gets distributed and nourishes the body. It's kind of the same thing with the energetic ley lines of the planet. And information is communicated through these ley lines, and it all leads back to the heart of Mother Earth, just as uh, the blood moves through and it goes through the circulatory system and then also moves through your heart, which is pumping and moving the energy. So it depends on whether the the energy has been um, released uh, or cleared or transmuted in a particular area. If you've got a lot of consciousness that is quite negative in a particular area, it will concentrate in these ley lines and these vortices where they cross. And, um, you know, you might find it quite heavy in those particular areas and you may not want to connect with the place if that's the case. Um, you might not have a desire, but again, even the land itself has that pristine divine level to it. What you're really connecting with is the energy, the residual energy. It's like the outer coating um, that you're connecting with, which really isn't real. All right, so just imagine connecting with the pristine part and the information that's contained, the wisdom that's contained in there for you. We'll say one last thing, and this is for you as well as for others. There are many beings in the fifth dimensional level who are happy to assist you in connecting both with the earth as well as uh, nature. Um, and by nature, they're also including the animals all right, that exist within that area. So you can have a deeper conversation with the plants and with the animals in the area. They're happy to help you to do that, whether that's you making to need a subtle adjustment within yourself, letting go of a fear, or whether that is shifting and opening your perspective to see things in a slightly different way. There are many beings that are present. A lot of fairy energy um, is present to help with that. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you very much for calling in. You're welcome. Take care now. Later. All right. So who's next on the list? Uh, Area code 605, you are on the air. What's your name, where you're from, what's your question? Hey there. Um, I'm Alex from South Dakota. Um, How you doing? I got a question. Good, 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 thank you. Um, Set a question for Wendy and her guides. Um, Big fan of her work. Um, I'm uh, developing a lot uh, intuitively, and it's something I've always wanted to do since I was little. And um, <clears throat> I guess I'm I'm working on uh, expanding that and actually doing a lot more work, like on a professional level, and making that, um, you know, like part of my income. I guess, and I guess I just <laughs> wanted some uh, advice uh, in from in in that area. Uh, there are some issues around responsibility that you are in the process of of integrating and letting go of. Um, it's mm-hmm. really important to be clear about what is yours and what is n- not yours. Um, okay. There is, they call it almost a boundary issue, and think of okay. it as maintenance of frequency, that okay. it's it's not about you having to fix anything for anybody else. That's their responsibility. Mm-hmm. You're simply presenting information, and then what they do with it is up to them. The guides often will describe that when they are working with you, that they're just really good at pointing out frequencies that need to be shifted, and it's easier for you to do it because they can get to the very specific frequency instead of kind of a broad range of things that kind of need to be adjusted. But that's up to you to make that shift. So part of what you are going through right now is integrating the responsibility piece. Look to other areas of your life where you're taking on more responsibility than it's yours. Um, okay. with family or friends, uh, mm-hmm. and that will also help you. Um, <laughs> they're also saying that it might not hold everything that you want it to. So it's fine. Go explore it. But yeah. there may be some other things that you'll want to add in, other modalities of working with energy, and there might be a slightly different path, but you won't know until you take the first step. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for calling in. Take care now. Our next person on the list is another 111 individual. Uh, 111, 111, 1111. How you doing? What's your name? Where you're from? What's your question? 
That's where your number came up as. Yeah, I can hear you. How you doing? Hello? Hello, I said I can hear you. You're on the air. Uh, Do you know you're on the air right now? Hello, I can hear you. Are you, you, uh, got a question? You're just listening. Hello, going once. You're on the air. You can talk now. All right, uh, later. (laughs) All right, don't really know what that was all about, but uh, let's move on to the next caller. Area code uh, 202. Area code 202, you're on the air. What's your name, where you're from, what's your question? Okay, this is Michelle from Washington, D.C. Um, Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good afternoon. I I, I lost my job recently, (laughs) like last week. So my question is, what was the lesson of that, and when do you see me having a new position? Um, So what they're they're showing me is that it's you kind of repositioning yourself. Kind of, it it wasn't enough. Any time that we are in a situation, um, as far as a job goes or relationships, there have to be enough points of attraction. There have to be enough things that we want to work on within that construct. And the job wasn't holding all of that. Um, so it, it, you could say it's not big enough. So it's helping you to really reassess what it is that you want in a job, um, the qualities, the essence of it, whether that's doing something that allows you to use your analytical skills or something that allows you to use your creative skills. Um, they're actually saying that you need both. Um, to work in something that is very analytical is going to shut you down energetically. So to do accounting or something that is very structured and analytical all day long, that does analysis all day long, um, it's it's not going to allow you enough uh, creative expression, so you're going to shut your energy down. You're not going to want to be there. Um, and you also need a fair amount of flexibility. So if you're stuck doing something 9 to 5 every single day without – a change in the routine, whether that's the people that you're working with or the projects that you're working with, that's also not going to support you. So it's really important for you to be clear when you're putting together the list of the qualities that you want out of the next job that those things go in there. Pay attention to what you didn't like in the last job um, because that will that will also show you what you want in the next job. You'll You'll work with the opposite of that. So if people were really... Um, not very friendly, then you want to make sure you put, I want to work with very friendly, outgoing people uh, on on the next job. Um, Just looking here. You're actually allowing yourself to have just a little bit of time of, of recharge. So try not to get too worried about it. Um, I know sometimes it can get very difficult when you start thinking about money or will this other thing ever show up. You're actually giving yourself just a little bit of time to recharge some downtime for yourself before. So um, it may take a little bit longer than than your ego might hope, but not too much longer. So it might take an extra couple weeks. Uh, but um, that's fine because it's giving you a chance to recharge. Okay, so, does so, it help? So, okay, so you don't see a month or anything? Mm. You may have some opportunities that come up at the end of September, but um, they might not hold everything that you want. So you've got some choices to make. You might feel that you're settling and you might step into it, or you can hold out for another couple weeks and get something that's in a better alignment. Okay. Thank you. Mhm. All right. Thank you very much for calling in. Take care now. Later. All right. Two more callers. Uh, area code uh, three six zero. Area code three six zero. You're on the air. What's your name? Where you're from? What's your question? Hi, I'm Sylvia from Miami. Uh, my question is: uh, I quit my office job many months ago and have tried to stay away from working for someone, but it hasn't worked out. And I'd like to know what is not letting me get to a point where I have a means where I have a means of income without having to work for someone. I'm going to let the piece take this one because I think there are levels to it. 
so dear, part of what you've created for yourself is um, a situation for you to really reassess, um, you know, what, again, it is that you want because we think vibrationally it's actually going to serve you better for the period that you're in to be under somebody else's umbrella, for you to um, not have to have some of the stresses that you would have or that you would create for yourself working by yourself. Um, and this is just temporary. It's almost like your stepping stone. Part of the reason why you're not seeing everything light up for yourself by yourself is because that's not quite it's not quite the right time. So allow yourself the flexibility. Allow yourself to, again, we would say, uh, just as Wendy was describing before, going back to the essence of the qualities that you want and letting go of the idea or of form. You've got it in your mind that the only way to have those things is to work for yourself. You can still have those experiences in a slightly different way, um, but the essence is there by working under somebody else's umbrella with less stress for yourself right now. And then probably in about another 16 to 18 months, you're going to find that you may be ready to step out on your own, that there are some new skills and new perspectives that you will have so that you won't carry the same stress load that you would if you started it by yourself right now. All right? Mm -hmm. So be open to how that can all start to expand, uh, how you can start to have more income flowing in and and really working. Be open to how that that can take place. Um, There can be some new opportunities coming that you might not even have on the radar. There's actually something with children um, that being under somebody else's umbrella that may come up. So don't be shocked, but it allows you to to work in a very heart-centered way using your skills, gifts, and abilities. Yeah, actually, that was my uh, that was another question, like what to look up, to look out for, what kind of jobs. Yeah, they, well, the the potential that we're seeing coming has to do with working with children, um, and it's um, it's really helping to support children with their growth and their well being. It's it's. Um, it's a form of education, but not a uh, formal education. So it's helping children who need uh, a little love, uh, a little attention, um, and some structure in their lives. So this this company is already doing it. This corporation is already doing it, and it, you might find that it kind of drops in your lap. So don't be shocked. It might not be anything that you would have thought of doing, but it'll show up. It will excite you, and um, you might want to move towards it. All right? Great. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you for calling in. Take care now. All right, last caller in the queue here. Area code 276. You are on the air. What's your name? Where you're from? What's your question? Hi, my name is Andrea, and um, I want to let Wendy know that I love her work. But I wanted to call in tonight because I know a lot of people have lost loved ones and they've crossed over. And a lot of people are finding it, including myself at some times, but um, mostly for others, that we need to into our I am, I can roles and to work through the grief and get motivated and get back into life. And I was just wondering what the advice of the P's would be for myself and other people. So when it comes to the passing of a loved one. It stirs within all of you two big things. One is that your own mortality and your safety. All right, what's going on with my body? What's my health? What's How am I feeling safe? Um, and it can also trigger more of your issues of separation. You know, your core wound for all of you is your separation from source. It also presents you with an opportunity to elevate yourself be beyond those ideas of of separation and beyond the idea of yourself as a mortal being. So try to put your focus there. Try to think of it in in terms that your loved ones are in a much easier place. It's very difficult, this game that you all play in. Uh, We always say it's much easier on the other side. And so on the other side, we're still watching and observing you and, and, you know, your loved ones do their best to help you in every way that they can from the other side. They're never separate from you. They're always ever-present. And because they experience no time, they're with you all the time. Every moment that you think about them, they're standing beside you. 
And from their perspective, you're always right there. Uh, think of it like having a friend on the phone. You've just got the, the, the muted for the moment. And when you think about them, you can unmute the line. But they're there. And and no, um, well, your guys are telling us that think of it this way. Your loved ones wouldn't want you to be in grief for an extended period of time. It's it's human nature to go through your process of grief, yes. But they also want you to live. They also want you to be happy. They want you to be joyous. They want you to express your passion. So if it helps you to think of it from the terms of the perspective of your loved one, that they want you to get moving, it will help you um, so that you're not feeling um, that you're separate from them. As you're thinking about them thinking of you, and moving forward, that will help you strengthen the connection. One of the other things that we would also help you uh, or suggest for you all when you are finding yourselves in, in the grips of grief and in, in, well, in the grips of depression even, uh, is to take the focus off of yourself because what happens is you continually run this limited program, I'm separate, I'm separate, I'm separate. Uh, depression is the perceived disconnection from source energy. All right, we say perceived because you're never separate from source. If you're depressed, that means you need to sit down and you need to breathe. We call breath the great connector. It moves energy at both the, uh, in the energetic field but also at the physical level. So when you consciously breathe, you're moving more energy and you are reinforcing your conscious awareness of your connection to source energy. And we would also recommend that you... Take the focus off yourself, off your limiting programs. The fastest way for you to all do that is to be of service. All right, so do something for someone else, whether that is volunteering your time or helping your friends. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but simply take the focus off of yourself, and that will help you, all right, because you stop looking at your own small problems, as it were. You you get off the illusion, all right, uh, and you put yourself back into that space of service. And and really, when you're in service, your heart's in it. All right, so we hope that helps answer your question. Yes? Yes, thank you. You're very thank welcome. You very much. Thank you very much for calling in. I think I've set a new record for callers in the queue and uh, people in the chat room, too. Thank you very much. Take care now. Bye-bye. All right, that is the uh, last caller. Um, we do have uh, eight minutes and 11 seconds left on the live feed. We can go a little past that if you want to finish a thought, but I do like to try to keep my shows to two hours for the sake of all those people who have lousy attention spans. So <laughs> we have a couple – I have a couple questions about specific ET races, so let's try to do this on the fly here. Three races, uh, the Arcturians. Uh, first of all, uh, in regards to Arcturians and some other races, I remember Andrew Bartzis, Akashic Records reader, and my personal favorite source of info on my show because of his Akashic reading skills, talked about how the Library of Alexandria was destroyed because of some sort of a timeline incursion going on um, at the ET and interdimensional level and also some wars going on on Earth. And at the ET dimension, multidimensional level, you had the, he said, the wars and the gold and mineral mining operations between the Arcturians, Syrians, and us, like the Anunnaki from Nibiru that Zachariah Sitchin talked about, although Zachariah Sitchin did make the mistake of like obsessing about the planet Nibiru and the Anunnaki. He was he forgot to include some of the other races in that, and the Arturians were one of them. And then there was also the stuff going on on Earth that caused some timeline incursion, which caused the library to be destroyed. But um, that, I guess that's really a side issue here. But the Arcturians, and um, if they were involved in some sort of a war like he talked about and some gold mining operations, then I don't mean to elaborate on that. But what can you tell us about the Arcturians? you got six minutes and 50 seconds on the live feed. All right, dear. So it's the Pleiadians, and we're going to take this one because we haven't really discussed this with Wendy. So um First, we want to talk about the timeline incursions as you perceive them. This is what was being described before as, in some ways, moving to a now moment that is drastically different. All right, so you have to create some sort of physical reality in which it ceases to exist, and that can be um, a natural disaster. That can be uh, that a library gets blown up so the information isn't available. You're creating a physical manifestation for the energy so that you can be on another timeline, as it were, so you can shift things. Now, the Arcturans, for the most part, 
they are not physical beings, but most that are interacting with you. Beings that we would align with or say um, are part of the, we would place their alignment with Arcturus at the physical level or more Lyrans. So uh, from our perspective, is, is we observe the records, most of the Arcturans are not uh, coming down into your physical density with, with what you would consider to be a solid, dense body. All right, they have light bodies. Um, and their, their participation in what you would consider to be wars is well in your past uh, from your, your timeline. Um, even as we talk about it to the linear mind, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to kind of put all these pieces together because we're talking about what appears to be their wars would have been the equivalent of about 600,000 years ago. So as you are looking at the expression of some of these collective issues, what is it? It's, a, it's about lack and limitation. It's about competition and and wanting to hold power over particular pieces of information that would keep humans from expressing more of their divine light. How do you play that out at the microcosmic level here on Earth? You destroy a library that holds the information. All right? So as it was played out in what is perceived to be your past, all right, all those hundreds of thousands of years ago, the now moment that you're standing on that says, you know, uh, we we want to limit that because we want to be able to pull the issues in from those systems where they weren't able to resolve those. How do we do it? We do it by creating an incident that the library is destroyed and we don't have access to it any longer. So instead of going outside of ourselves for the information, we have to start going inside. All right. We hope this makes sense in some small way. But, um, you know, as far as the Arcturans having physical bodies, again, they're, they're not dense in the way that you're, you're asking about. And the universe is an incredibly vast place. Your, your, your galaxy is teeming with different species, many that you can't even begin to imagine. What you imagine is your species on Earth, uh, some of your aquatic life, uh, some of the smaller insects, those are large species uh, on other planets. They're the dominant species, uh, and they're they're quite large in size, things that you just don't even imagine. But there are a handful that you hear about over and over and over again because those are the ones that you're playing most directly with, and those are the ones whose DNA you've taken on or whose energetic records you are trying to to integrate here and now. Thank Anything you very you much. Ask us about that. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, we can do one more quick question uh, here. The live field will go off in two minutes, 50 seconds, but we can go a little past that anyway. Um, the uh, feline race, uh, there's a couple different feline races. Uh, Ray Kusalan at GT Contact D in my interview um, talked about um, one very intelligent feline race that is, I believe, of uh, ninth dimension, I think he said they're from, uh, but that's not the same feline race that's featured in all sorts of structures throughout the uh throughout the ancient world that George Kavaslis told me um, about what, that was very prominent in ancient times. Um, so this specific feline race, I'm assuming it's not the one that um, Ray Gusalinich talked about. Um, you did touch, uh, Wendy did touch on it briefly, so um, why don't you tell us a few bits and pieces about that, uh, two minutes and ten seconds before the live feed is up, just so you know. Well, you've got uh, quite a, a concentration of felines in the Lyran system as well as the Syrian system, and the Syrians are the ones who have shown up in your Egyptian artifacts, Sekhmet, um, in and in the times of Egypt. So those are the ones that you're seeing there. Um, and they have been at the forefront of some of the, um, some of the wars in different systems. Uh, they're very territorial. Um, not all of them, but, but many of them. Uh, and they're very opinionated. They're very, um, they're very focused on, on what it is they want to accomplish and about how they think they, they are going to get there. Uh, so it's a blessing and a curse, all right? It's like being stubborn. It can help you to stay focused, but also it can be that you're too focused. Uh, and so this is one of the traits of the, of the felines. They can be quite loving within their own pride, if you will, 
um, if you're accepted into the family, but they can also be very fiercely um, protective. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Thank you for summarizing that quickly. Um, I guess we uh, might as well bring this show to a close now. Life feed will end in 50 seconds. So, um, Wendy, I guess I'll take this moment to tell you the same thing I tell all of my guests. You are a fascinating individual, and there's no question that because of the fascinating things you've learned from your fascinating ET contactees that I could certainly do another show with you. However, one of the goals with this radio show that I have is to get as many different guests on my show as possible before giving any one specific guest double dips as I feel that is the fairest, most impartial, and ultimately the most informative way of doing a radio show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. So that does mean I regret to say I probably will not be asking you to come on my show again, but please understand that's only because I need to give thousands of other fascinating individuals the chance to have some glory on my radio show. But it was indeed having a pleasure having you on. We learned a lot of stuff in this interview. I will definitely make sure this gets uploaded to YouTube and gets spread far and wide so lots of people will uh, will be able to listen to the fascinating info that you and your fascinating Pleiadian um, contactees had to say. And um, again, I wish you luck. It was a pleasure. And I do hope this uh, interview inspires a lot of people to go on your site, higherfrequencies.net, and come in contact with you to um, learn a lot of things about themselves and the nature of reality in general. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care, Wendy. Namaste. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, folks, that is the end of this show. I will be have doing another show in two days, as a matter of fact. Uh, James Bartley will be my guest. Will probably be um, won't be as pleasant a note as this show because we'll be talking more about malevolent extraterrestrials in that episode, like the uh, reptilians and the greys and such, because he has a lot of military knowledge and the uh, malevolent ETs that have been involved with that, as well as some some ET contacts experience as well he's had. Um, so James Bartley will be the guest on Friday. I'm doing uh, two shows in a week just to uh, catch up on some of the shows that I've missed. So. Please, I hope you guys will tune in and, and on this Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern for James Bartley. So uh, that's the end of this episode. This is Andrew Fisher signing off from Nature of Reality Radio. Namaste, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your trek throughout infinite consciousness.